Hello and welcome to our special broadcast. I'm Parikshit Lutra. A U.S. court has indicted Gautam Adani, his nephew Sakar Adani, and several other officials for allegedly bribing Indian government officials to obtain solar energy contracts. According to the indictment, Adani allegedly paid bribes to the tune of over 2,000 crore rupees. This includes an alleged bribe of 1,750 crore rupees to a high-ranking official in Andhra Pradesh government who has not been named. U.S. authorities allege Gautam Adani met this Andhra Pradesh official personally to advance the execution of the deal. Adani Group is also accused of concealing information about the FBI probe into the Indian financial institutions and investors. The indictment says Sagar Adani's electronic devices were seized in March 2023 and Gautam Adani was informed about the investigation at the same time. In response, Adani has refuted all allegations, calling it baseless and denied any wrongdoing. Adani went on to say the defendants are presumed innocent until proven guilty. We're now joined by Manish Tiwari, Lok Sabha MP, Senior Congress Leader, and also a member of Parliamentary Committee on Finance. Uh, Mr. Tiwari, how do you see the opposition taking this up in uh, the upcoming session of Parliament? This is definitely going to be a big issue, but uh, how do you plan to raise it? Will you be seeking a reply from the Finance Ministry on this as well? Well, Parikshit, before we come to how the opposition is planning to raise it, uh, I think it would be important and germane to point out that uh, these allegations are extremely concerning. And these are not allegations now. Uh, this is an indictment. And so, therefore, uh, the uh, prosecutors in the United States, uh, both uh, the prosecutors in the Eastern District Court of New York and the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, seem to have found uh, enough prima facie uh, evidence uh, to be able to present an indictment in court. So therefore, uh, the matter is very serious. It has uh, ramifications and repercussions not limited to a particular company or to the Adani group of companies, but has a bearing on the overall reputation of India as a business destination, India as a business hub. And therefore, under those circumstances, uh, it is important that the government takes these allegations extremely seriously because the uh, charge is the alleged bribery of Indian officials. So therefore, uh, government of India uh, ought to take this very seriously because it does not really concern uh, as I earlier pointed out, one particular entity or one business group, uh, namely the Adani group of companies, but has an overall bearing on how India uh, would be viewed by the rest of the world as a business de uh, destination where business practices are transparent, open, and are uh, conducted with a degree of integrity. Right. Uh, Mr. Devari, one question that is coming to our mind is about the kind of fine that the Adani group, the Azure Power Group and others accused of this case may have to pay up. What we've given to understand that this could be a hefty fine in case you try and go for a settlement and even then you may not be off the hook completely. Uh, the, set, the fine could be anywhere, uh, could, be, could be decided basis the bribe given in India and also the capital that you've raised from the U.S. markets. Could you give us a sense of what could be the actual cost penalty for the accused involved and how it will be calculated going forward? Well, first of all, uh, Parikshit, I think uh, there's an implicit assumption uh, that uh, there would be a plea bargain. Uh, the plea bargain really depends as to the whether the prosecutors are interested in settling or not. So therefore, eventually, uh, it would go to a court and a court will have to adjudicate uh, on the merits of the case. So therefore, uh, it's a two-step process, presuming hypothetically, if somebody was to go down the path of a plea bargain, first of all, whether a plea bargain is at all going to be acceptable to the prosecutors, and number two, even if it is acceptable to the prosecutors, Will the uh, judge or the judges in question uh, be willing to uh, adjudicate on that offer? So I think uh, there are uh, lots of ifs and buts at this point in time. And therefore, uh, hmm. it's a legal process. It's a trial. 
and the trial will obviously mm. play itself out uh, into concurrent uh, jurisdictions if my information is correct or if the indictments which are available in the public space are correct there seem to be two separate indictments uh, one by the us attorney for the eastern district of new york and the other uh, by the securities and uh, securities exchange commission hmm. uh, you're right sir there are two sets of indictments and in this case the foreign extortion prevention act has also been applied which gives uh, the U.S. authorities the power to move against government officials. Currently, they've not named the Andhra Pradesh government official to whom a bribe was allegedly offered. But at some stage, they can even summon government officials involved. Do you feel that the Indian government uh, and all the businessmen accused involved in this case will now have to start engaging with U.S. authorities on this case? Will this case also be taken up <coughs> diplomatically? Well, uh, I do presume that you were referring to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and not the Foreign Extortion uh, Practices Act. Till the time, they're two separate sir, statutes. There are, sir, there are both. Both of them have been invoked in this case. So, therefore, uh, I frankly am not uh, aware of the second statute, which is the first one that you referred to, the Foreign Extortion Practices Act. So, that's something which... Uh, will have to be studied, but eventually uh, it is now up to those people who have been named in the indictment and their lawyers as to how uh, would they really like to approach this matter and how would they like to take it up before the courts in the United States. But suffice to say, you see, the concerns have been deeper and profound, knowing uh, going back to the Hindenburg revelations. And if you do recollect, we had... Uh, done a conversation on that, and at that point in time, also I had said that a joint parliamentary committee needs to be constituted in order to go into not only the uh, allegations which came out in the Hindenburg report, but more importantly, uh, the credibility, the integrity, the processes which our market regulator follows, because it is ironical that uh, while uh, SEBI uh, to a very, very great extent, has been giving a clean chit uh, even earlier uh, when the Hindenburg uh, report was being judicially adjudicated. The Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States has found enough prima facie evidence uh, to proceed uh, against uh, this Indian entity, uh, namely the Adani group of companies. So obviously, you know, to that extent, uh, uh, anybody who has been indicted is correct when they say that you are innocent until proven guilty. But as I was earlier pointing out, that a joint parliamentary committee is actually the need of the day because it is not mm -hmm. only a question of one particular entity. It is as to how this is going to have a bearing on uh, India's entire uh, business environment. Number two, more importantly, uh, what about our own regulators? Uh, were our regulators really not aware or did this not fall to their remit or they deliberately chose uh, not to exercise oversight? So therefore, there are very, very uh, uh, disturbing questions which arise. And uh, under those circumstances, since the only authority which exercises oversight over the regulators is the uh, is parliament or parliament through the right. standing uh, standing committee uh, parliamentary standing committee of finance uh, it would be appropriate mm. that this entire matter uh, be examined uh, by a joint parliamentary committee because your know, concerns are not limited to one geography alone right there are concerns mm. which have emanated from other geographies also so therefore, so there Mr. is. Sivari, can we assume that the Parliamentary Committee on Finance would now like to summon SEBI officials to understand uh, whether they were aware of these allegations and this investigation well, in the U.S.? Well, I can't uh, second guess what the Parliamentary Standing Committee uh, would do or would not do, because eventually uh, that is something which the committee would have to collectively decide, and it will be inappropriate for me to. Uh, make a statement on behalf of the committee 
which clearly does not fall to my remit. I think the appropriate person to uh, address this question to would be the chairperson of the Parliamentary Standing Committee of Finance. Uh, he would be in a better position to answer it. But uh, suffice to say that uh, I think given the, uh, given the ramifications involved, uh, it would be appropriate if this matter is dealt by a joint parliamentary committee. I remember two years back I had written uh, an op-ed in a leading newspaper uh, where I had forcefully argued and articulated the need for setting up such a committee. And uh, therefore, under those circumstances, that should be the way forward. Right. My final question, sir, very briefly. Uh, this investigation has been going on for the last two to three years. Azure Power, one of the accused, has told us in a statement that they have been following this investigation and the directors mentioned have left the company. They said they, do not, they don't deny or uh, contest the charges, at least in uh, the media reports. As far as the Adani group is concerned, they have said that these are baseless charges and they deny it altogether. But having said that, considering this investigation was going on in the United States, was it incumbent on these companies to also inform Indian authorities? Because this was a matter, the Hindenburg report was also before the Supreme Court. Was it incumbent before the Adani group to keep the Indian authorities, the Indian market regulator, informed about this investigation? Well, more importantly, the regulator uh, should have uh, exercised uh, his or who, uh, her uh, authority uh, in order to find out as to what really was going on with its counterpart in the United States and with the concurrent criminal investigation which was playing itself out. Because uh, going by the indictment, it seems that these reports were available in the public space. So therefore, obviously, the company needed to keep the Indian regulator in the loop, but that's one part of it. The regulator on his or her own was actually uh, supposed uh, to do the due diligence and, uh, and, and ask the company that what is really uh, going on and uh, transparently kept uh, not only the investors, uh, but also the nation in the loop uh, with regard to uh, whatever allegedly was playing itself out in the United States of America. All right, uh, Mr. Tiwari, thank you so much for joining us, giving us your view on uh, what has transpired in this case, how this will be seen politically uh, in Parliament and the questions for the Indian government and regulators as well. Uh, we are going to take a short break on the segment, but don't go anywhere. When we return, we'll uh, take a deep dive into the Adani indictment with senior Supreme Court lawyer H.P. Ranina on the other side. Welcome back. You're watching our special broadcast. A U.S. court has indicted Gautam Adani, his nephew Sagar Adani, and several other officials for allegedly bribing Indian government officials to obtain solar energy contracts. So what are the next legal steps that the Adani group can take now? Uh, legal sources have told CNBC TV18 that the accused can either submit to the court's jurisdiction or challenge it. The group can also try to settle the matter. However, settlement will involve a high fine. Sources have said that U.S. courts and the SEC will consider the bribe amount as well as the capital raised in U.S. to determine the settlement amount. The accused can also try to contest the orders after which a trial will begin. The Foreign Extortion Prevention Act has also been invoked in the matter. Uh, the, the case is one where the U.S. authorities can also try to prosecute Indian government officials. We're now joined by H.P. Ranina, senior lawyer at the Supreme Court. Mr. Ranina, first of all, if you can help us understand now, going by past precedents, if you look at the Siemens case of 2008, there the company had settled the bribery-related case with the U.S. Department of Justice and also with uh, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission for something like uh, $300 million each. Now, in a case like this, how would the fine be calculated? At what stage can you actually look at settlement? Is settlement even an option right now? Or would they have to... Uh, file a plea before the U.S. courts and the SEC to see if that can happen and is agreeable to? Parishit, I uh, think uh, both avenues are open. They will go for settlement. At the same time, they will not shut the window of going in appeal. 
and therefore uh, the appeal appellate procedure will take place immediately because there may be a time limit for filing an appeal. And once that is done, uh, at the same time, the settlement proceedings can continue. And as you rightly point out, the amount will run into huge uh, figures like uh, $300, 400000000 million. This again is going to be a tremendous drain on the entire Dani group of companies and will have their repercussions in India. But to come to your point, certainly all the avenues will be taken care of and appeal is certainly... And you'll have to settle the case, point. not just with the Department of Justice. It'll have to be separately settled with the SEC. So the fines Absolutely. and the settlement amounts will be separate for both. I agree with you. So it may be uh, 300 per, uh, million per uh, jurisdiction or per court or whatever the figure is. Now, as you know, in America, this is left to the judges to decide. And sometimes uh, they impose a very heavy fine. Sometimes they impose a reasonable fine. So really, it's very difficult to suggest uh, what is how, how it's going to pan out. But certainly, the amount right. should be huge. And therefore, therefore, it will have an impact on the Indian uh, companies as well, because some of the funds will have to go from India. And apart from that, yeah. uh, there, the other issue is that they will be debarred from raising funds from uh, the US uh, jurisdiction or from a European jurisdiction for a long time to come. That's another implication which you must not forget, that they'll be debarred from raising right. funds the year after. Right. Uh, what does this also mean about their status and their passport status for all the accused in this matter? Uh, can they actually now travel to the United States or any country uh, with which the United States has a legal treaty? I don't think they should. They can't take a chance. Certainly, they should not travel to any of those states uh, so, because they're certainly, if the uh, creditors move the court, uh, they can be arrested, certainly. So I don't think anybody will take uh, even a 1% risk of traveling to any of these countries, either the United States or countries which have a mm -hmm. agreement with the U.S. whereby any person who is accused in the U.S. can be arrested in another country as well. So they will certainly not uh, right. travel to any of those countries. That's I'm, I'm very sure on that score. Right. Now, the indictment also mentions that the U.S. authorities will have the power of forfeiture. Basically, they can forfeit properties of the accused to make good the bribe amount or the amount that has been raised uh, from U.S. capital markets, uh, the penalty amount. So can that process of forfeiture begin right away? For example, Azure, if it has some property in the United States or if the Adani Group has some property in the United States, can the U.S. authorities, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice start forfeiting those properties? I think they will forfeit only if they are not able to pay up. So they will be given mm -hmm. a chance. First of all, the amount will have to be crystallized. They'll be have, they will be given a certain number of weeks to pay that money. And in case they are not able to pay, then, of course, the possibility of forfeiture is definitely there. So the risk of forfeiture is there to the extent of the assets which are lying in those countries. Right. Uh, we will also see some major changes in the U.S. Justice Department, uh, the SEC, after the 20th of January. Will it be possible that a new administration in the U.S. may look at this any differently? Or you feel that it is unlikely that the political establishment may intervene in a matter which has gone to the U.S. courts and it is at a very advanced investigation stage? I think it's very difficult to answer that question, but everything is possible. That's all that I would like to say. Politically, yes, they can. Uh, now you, they have appointed a new uh, the attorney general who is very close to the president-elect. And certainly uh, it can be done if they want to. So it's very difficult to answer that question. But uh, I think the courts, if they're left to themselves, will, take, will allow the, uh, the law to take its own course. And whatever fines or other, uh, you know, imprisonment or whatever other uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the service that they want to give, that will be done by the courts. And as far as I know, courts do not allow for interference, but one can never say what happens. Because there have been cases right. where uh politically 
they have they have done something which, uh, as you know, the judges there are politically appointed. They are not independent as right. they are in India, and therefore, wherever there are political okay. appointments, there are bound to be some issues involved. Right at this stage, sir, do you expect uh, the U.S. Department of Justice, the U.S. Court in New York, and also the SEC to ask all the accused to pay a certain amount immediately? What do you think happens next in this case? And whatever penalty that will be imposed by the courts, how is that exactly calculated? So the calculation is based on the amount of loss which may have been suffered, which, uh, which any investor may have suffered. As I said, it is possible that a class action suit may be brought in by some of the affected parties against the Adani group, saying that they had not disclosed certain information which they ought to have done at the time when they made the issue. So that uh, issue will happen, possibly. And as far as the amount is concerned, it will be based entirely on the, the quantum which has been raised. But there again, the courts, the judges in the, in the United States have a lot of discretion. And uh, depending upon the circumstances of each case, they may impose the same amount, a lower amount, or even a higher amount. So it's very difficult to quantify. But the first step is they must quantify the amount, and thereafter they can take whatever steps they need to take to recover the same. All right. Mr. Rina, thank you so much for joining us on the program. With that, it's a wrap on this special broadcast. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.